Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's great to be here amongst you in the far north. And it was delightful as I was driving up and got out of the out of the big smoke there in Auckland and um, got over the hill. And as I uh, looked down, my eyes caressed the beautiful landscape uh, there before me and just knew that I was just moments away uh, from uh, this place right here in uh, Whangarei. So it's good to be here this morning. I greet you in the name of Jesus, and uh, there's no other name. Would you say amen? I'm also so blessed to find out that in my coming this morning that it has coincided with uh, endless praise who are here. And may I say, it was 30 years ago when they were called uh, uh, the Spanish Singers. And then later on, they evolved and became Iron and Clay and then became Endless Praise. So there is a a kind of a, well, there is a history and uh, to this group that goes back, that dates back about 30 years. And I and my wife uh, were out of Christ. We weren't in church. And uh, I was playing rugby league at the time. And I wandered into church and I sat in the back and Endless Praise, I mean, Spanish singers in those days were singing. And they ministered to me, and uh, there began a journey, a spiritual journey for me, and uh, where I eventually uh, met the Lord Jesus Christ, and from there on uh, became a preacher of the Word. So I don't know uh, why it is the Lord has uh, coincided my coming and their coming here today, but I'm praying that there is somebody who was who is, who, who might be like me, sitting where you are right now, uh, who has come out of uh, curiosity or has come come out of courtesy and has just come for the day or just a few hours to see what's going on in here. I pray that God will arrest you the same way he did me 30 odd years ago. I pray that you would support their ministry while they're here and enjoy them because you can never measure uh, the, 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 the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ that is sown into lives of people. Turn to the person next to you and say he's talking about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to invite you, if you would, uh, to come with me into the book of Genesis 22. Genesis 22 is our place uh, of missional assignment and contemplation and reflection and instruction this morning. Uh, It's great to be back here in the Whangarei Church. uh, Good to see Jan Greenfield. Uh, I remember him from way back. He's still here. And it's good to also have the pastor, uh, my brother Gary and his dear wife uh, Miriani. It's great to have you both here ministering. Uh, aren't they a great couple? Would you say amen? And uh, we're just so blessed to have them on our team here at the conference. And also see my, my other pastoral colleague, uh, Pastor Ken Curtis and his family. It's great to, to, to have him here. He was uh, We used to serve way back in the day. And it's good to come back into the conference and see uh, some of these um, friends and family um, who have been faithful in the journey. And it's good to, and also, how could I miss, uh, oh, my dear sister, my do- well, you're a daughter to us, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, who's here also with endless praise. Genesis 22. And um, I'm going to read from verses 1 through to 19. It's a bit of reading, but however, I'm not going to read by myself. I'm going to invite you, if you would read with me, and um, and I'm going to invite you to do something um, that may be a little foreign to you, and that is, I want you to go to the Word, Genesis 22, verse 1 to 19, and then I'm going to invite you to look across Uh, the aisle and look behind you and before you. And if there's nobody with the word, I'm now going to invite you to be a great disciple maker. Get up from where you are and go to them so that they can read the word together with you. And we're going to read it aloud. Would you say amen? All right. So uh, let's do that. If you would look around, please, and uh, take the opportunity to read the word. We don't want you to come to the king's table and leave malnourished this morning. We want uh, your soul nourished, so if you would look around, your left and your right, make sure we have everyone 
in the word this morning, and then we will read it aloud in whatever translation you got and whatever vernacular that is comfortable for you to read it so that you may understand the word. We will read it together and read it aloud. And when you read it, please lift your voice as you read. All right, I will usher you in at the count, and then at the end of the reading of the word, I will pray. Let us read together one, two. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay hold, lay, lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven the second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of the enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Bathsheba. And Abraham stayed in Bathsheba. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that we have this privilege that is ours to sit still in the peace of this moment and to not only read your word, but to also think about how you have preserved your word over centuries and over time, that we may be able to hear you speak through it. We pray, Lord, that as we have read it, we pray that you would read us and we may see you speak to us in ways we may have never heard before. We pray, Lord, that you align our wills with your will and our ways with your way. And then, Lord, let it be, Lord, that as we leave this place, we may live lives that will bring honor and glory to your name. Make this word relevant to every context and to every person's life. We pray, please, in Jesus' name, let everyone say amen and amen. I wonder if you would turn to the person next to you and say, it's going to be all right. I don't know how you came in this morning, and I don't know what you carry with you. I don't know what you've left behind to be here. And I also don't know what you're going to face when you leave here. I don't know what your week holds. But I want to let you know from the Word of God this morning that whatever it is, it's going to be all right. Mm -mm. It's going to be all right. 
I would pray that church would not be just a form that we exercise for this morning and then clock out and leave and leave the message here, but I would pray that you would take the message with you this morning to know that God spoke to me this morning and it's going to be all right. So if you fall asleep during the message, that's fine. You can sleep now because now you've got the message for this morning. (laughs) But it's going to be all right. Following the Lord sometimes can be quite confusing. Abraham and Sarah have followed the Lord for some time. They've left the Ur of the Chaldees. They have traveled all over the Middle East. They have received the the promise of God in Genesis 15 and in 17. They have waited for years on end for the promise that there would be a son, that there would be a child born to them. And then when the son comes and the child now is growing, the Bible says, and some time later, God tested Abraham. Some of you this morning have walked with the Lord for some time, and you signed up thinking that after you had given yourself to the Lord and yielded yourself over to his will and his way, that everything would be cruisy from here on, only to find out that there are some unexplained anomalies and enigmas and reversals in your life that you can't get your head around and you can't make sense. Quite frankly, you sit there in reflection, but you're discombobulated by everything that you're facing. You don't know how to make sense of it. It is in this frame that I think that Abraham may have been when God had already given him a son, and then God says to him, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, God knew, whom you love, and go and sacrifice him on a mountain that I will show you. It would seem to me that everything that God had said before up until now seems somewhat contradictory. It would seem like, excuse me, God, are you for real? God, are you talking to me? Have you got the right person? Are you sure you got the right address? Lord, I'm sure this message is not for me. It's for somebody else. Pass me over. But Lord, I I think you've got the wrong person. Have you really checked my IRD number to make sure you got the right person? It can't be me. But could I give you just three points this morning? And I just give you this point. One, this point here. And the first point is this. God will always steer you, no matter how difficult it is, because he can see his glory through you. Mm -hmm. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'll take that. Yeah, 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 I'll take that. See, we think that God has lost his mind. He's out of control. He doesn't know what he's doing. But I've learned to find out in the story that God will sometimes steer you in ways that don't make sense. But if you travel that road, you will see the glory of God down that road. And so it's amazing to me that when Abraham hears what God has told him, check this out. The Bible says, and Abraham the following morning got up in the morning and saddled his donkey. Ladies, hear me now. It's interesting to me that he didn't even talk to his wife about God's commands. Would you say amen, men? Oh, men are very slow this morning. (laughs) That's okay. We're not going to have a domestic in the house of God this morning. Uh, But it's interesting to me that Abraham doesn't consult with his wife. The Bible says early the next morning he got up, he saddled his donkey, got his two servants, cut some wood, and off he went. He didn't even talk to Sarah about it. I hypothesize in my mind to think that the reason why he didn't broach the subject with Sarah is because there would have been a domestic that morning. She would have said, excuse me, this is my boy? You, you mean to tell me, as, have you lost your mind? 
Are you talking to the right God? I read, I, I mean, I, I, I'm having my own devotionals myself, and that's not, well, if that's what God said to you, you didn't tell me that. But Abraham gets up and he goes. Would you say amen? The Bible then goes on to say that when Abraham left and he goes, he travels for three days. Three days, he doesn't say a word. He gets to the place that God has told him, and in the distance, he sees it. He turns around and he says to the two guys that he's traveling with, he and his son, and he says to these two guys, you know what? You guys have got to stay here. But listen to what he says. But me and the boy will go over and worship, and we will come back. Oh, you missed that. When I think of what he has just said in that moment, it just blows my mind. Because here you begin to realize that even while he's in a state of confusion, still, 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 he speaks hope against hopelessness. And he says, me and the boy will go and worship, but we will come back. You know, there's sometimes, uh, if you're going to go somewhere to be blessed, you've got to detach in order to attach. I don't know who I'm talking to. Some of us are so detached to some things, we're wondering why it is we don't get the next level of blessing. Is because we need to detach to attach. <laughs> there's some people who can't go with you where you need to go in order to be blessed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? So Abraham says, you know what, guys, you can't go where I'm going. You guys got to stay here, but I'm going to get my blessing anyway. So Abraham goes. Abraham goes, and as he goes, hmm, as he goes, I'm telling you, God will steer you so that you may see his glory. Would you say amen? So he goes, and when they're on their journey, the boy then turns around and says, Dad, the wood we got, the fire we got, the knife we have, but where is the burnt offering? Now, I don't know about you, but in contemplation of that question, as a father walking, I, I find that question very hard to answer. I, I, I don't know what to say to my son, my only son, if I was in that, in that predicament. But as he's walking, listen to how Abraham replies. Abraham says, he says, son, God will provide the burnt offering for the sacrifice. Would you say amen? Uh, he says, God will do it. Um, he doesn't look at it scientifically. He doesn't look at it logically. He doesn't look at it rationally. Turn to the person next to you and say, I know someone he's talking about right now. Just tell him, I know somebody he's talking about right now. <laughs> yeah. But he answers the question spiritually. He says, God himself will provide a sacrifice. I don't know my way out of here. I don't know how I'm going to get out of debt. I don't know how I'm going to get out of bankruptcy. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this mortgage failure. But I, I, I don't know how to, how to reach my son. I don't know how to reach my grandchildren. I don't know how to reach my daughter. I don't know how to reach my ex-wife. I don't know how to, I, I just don't know. But one thing I know, God is still on the throne. My reality now doesn't look like it makes sense. It looks disturbing and it looks confusing. I feel down on it, but you know what? I choose not to look around me, but to look above me. God himself is going to provide a way. You see, God will not only steer you a certain way to reveal his glory to you, but God, number two, he will bring what he'll bring you to, he'll also take you through. Thank you, Jesus. He'll not only bring you to a difficult point, but trust him, he will take you through it. Turn to the person next to you and say, the greater the struggle, the greater the glory. Just tell him that. The greater the struggle, the greater the glory. And so the Bible goes on to say, and when Abraham came to the place that God had showed him, he now builds an altar stone by stone. And then he places the wood over the altar. 
And then the Bible says, and then he got his son. Can you see Abraham binding up his son's ankles, his son's wrists behind his back or maybe in front? Now he lifts his son and places his son, his only son, whom he loved, and places his son on the wood. And as he places his son on the wood, my, 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 my. I go up and down through that chapter. I don't even see or read of the boy murmuring, complaining, or questioning. There is but silence in this moment. And as the father has a son on the altar, he picks the knife to slay his son. And God in the heavens moves when he sees this take place. And he cries out, Abraham! Interesting, because his name before that was Abram, which means exalted father. But his name right here is Abraham, father of a multitude. And here he is about to slay his son, his only son. And God, in an instance, cries out, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch the boy. Leave him. Oh, there's some things that moves God. And what moved God in this moment is because what Abraham was doing here with his son. You've got to understand that it's not how much you give God. but it's how much you have left. You miss that. It's not how much you give God, but it's how much you have left. You've got to understand that it wasn't about the amount of the sacrifice. It was about the disposition of the sacrificer. For when Abraham was making the sacrifice, he wasn't apart from the sacrifice. He was embodied in the sacrifice. He and the son were one and the same up in the sacrifice. That when he laid his son on the altar, he was laying himself on the altar. I don't know who's your Isaac this morning. Something, someone you so love. But I wonder this morning if you would put what it is you love on the altar and watch God do something with it. You gotta understand that after Abraham had come to this point, God then turns around and he says to Abraham, he says to Abraham, and now I know that you fear me and that you gave your son, your only son whom you love. Now I know you respect me more. You love me more. You prioritize me above everything else, even the one that you love the most. Now I know. Now I know. It's amazing to me when you study the story because it is only when God called, it was only after Abraham had raised the knife did God call. Are you listening to me? And it's when he raised the knife to slay his son that he looked up. And when he looked up, the Bible says, and there he saw a ram caught in the thicket. I like to illustrate it this way. Mount Moriah stood. As Abraham got closer and closer to the place to make the sacrifice, the ram on the other side was making its way up on the other side of the mountain. Turn to the person next to you and say, you needed to hear that this morning. Yes, 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 yes. Some of you are looking for your next blessing, and you're wondering why it's not coming. It's because your disobedience is a delay to the blessing. But if you walk in obedience to God's calling, you will find that God will also provide an answer. Turn to the person next to you and say, my answer's on the way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, sir. And the closer he got to the place where he was to manifest this level of obedience, as soon as he got there, he looked up and he saw God provide a ram in the thicket. Bible said that he went over. You see, what God will bring you to, he'll also bring you through. Would you say amen? 
And so he goes and he gets the ram. He sacrifices the ram instead of his son. And then the voice of God comes back the next time. He says, Abraham, Abraham, because you have done this, because you would not withhold your only son whom you love. Listen to what God says. And now I will surely bless you. Here's the last point. You see, God will test you before he can bless you. Oh, you're not listening to me. Turn to the person behind you and say he's after you again. Yeah, 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 yeah. God will test you and then he'll bless you. So many of us want the blessing, but we don't like the testing. But God will prepare you for the blessing by testing you first. Because he can't trust you right now with what you are desiring in your heart. You'll say, well, God really impressed me. He said he would do this for me, and I still can't see it. I, uh, I've been praying. I'm, but God is testing you. Would you say amen? He's preparing your character so that when the blessing comes, <laughs> you are fit to embrace what he's got for you. Would you say amen? God will test you to bless you. That's why I said right at the beginning to entitle this message, it's all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Where God is steering you, ultimately you will see his glory. What God has brought you to, hold fast. He'll take you through. And God will test you so that he can bless you. And so God says to Abraham, listen to what he says. Because he's not just talking to Abraham, he's talking to us this morning. He says, and your descendants will be as many as the stars. And as many as the grains of the sand on the beach. The beaches of this world. And your children, they will inhabit the cities of the enemies, of your enemies, and, and your offspring. The world will be blessed through your offspring. You might say, well, that seems so far-fetched. I mean, are you really talking to me, God? How can that be about me? Well, I want to tell you something. The seed of Abraham, through the seed of Abraham came Jesus Christ. Would you say Amen. And because we are believers in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we inherit all the blessings of Abraham. And so through you, God will bless the nations. Through you, sitting right here, you might say, excuse me, I can't get my head around this, Pastor Paul. I'm, I'm here in Whangarei. How can I bless the nations? I'm so glad you asked. The reason why you can bless the nations from Whangarei is because when you go down to the gas station, there's an Indian there. You go down to the local dairy, there's an Iraqi in there. You go down to the local fruit shop, there's a Chinaman there. And when you share Jesus with them, are you listening to me out there? As you share the gospel with an Indian, Potentially, you reach all of India. Would you say amen? Ha! You see, you don't have to leave Whangarei to bless the nations. God has brought, brought the nations to Whangarei. In fact, he brought a coconut boy all the way from Samoa, born by way of Taihape, all the way up here to bless the nations out here in Whangarei. Would you say amen out there? In fact, if you look around the church today, the nations are in the house of faith today. Praise the Lord. And the Lord says, and I will bless you. My sons, I have four of them and one daughter. We lost another daughter in Papua New Guinea. But my sons, every time I was trying to share my faith with them, my boys would say to me, Dad, you're forcing us to believe this whole thing about Christianity. I says, no, 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 son, I'm not forcing you. I'm leading you. They're like, well, well stop leading me. I says, I can't help it. Uh, 
if you were born in another family, okay, you would have a say, but you're not, you're not born in that family, you're born in this family. You've got to understand that uh, it was God's will that he designed us to be in this family. And he also put his name on my lips. So I can't hold these, this, these lips of mine that he created, but utter the name of Jesus in the hearing of your ears and also your heart. I pray that you would get it, son. And they would resist and they would fuss and curse and, and walk out. But, oh, God is good. Would you say amen? Ha! And now I've seen my sons come back one by one back to the Lord Jesus Christ and my daughter come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, as a result, now my children now share the gospel with their friends and their families. In fact, uh, talking about Indians, my, my son is getting married tomorrow to an Indian. Would you say amen? And I'm so excited because I see a gospel kingdom potential in this whole relationship. Would you say amen out there? I'm not moaning and groaning about the different differences in our ethnicities. No, no. I am celebrating the fact that God is extending his kingdom through my little meager, feeble life for his glory. It's going to be all right. And the reason why it's going to be all right is because we have a good God. Whew. Have you ever heard people get up the front and say, God is good? And everyone says, all the time. And then, all the time, God is good. There was one day I was sitting in church, and this was going on in church, and I was thinking to myself, can't those people up the front say something different? I was getting somewhat spiritually nauseous because it happened about seven, eight times in the one service. God is good all the, all the time. God is good. And I was sitting there in my critical mind going, oh, these people just saying this thing is a time for it's, well, it's now become a cliche. And as I was sitting there, the Holy Spirit arrested me and said, stop being critical. I am good. And I'm good all the time. And then he started to show me how good he is. He started to tell me, he says, Paul, do you know how good I am? He says, I'm so good. Without me, nothing is good. But because of me, everything is good. He says, do you know how good I am, Paul? I am so good that I created the universe. I'm so good I created you. I created humankind so that I could share my goodness with everybody, including you. And I sat there, and I was uh, sitting there, and God was just talking to me like this. And he says, Paul, do you know how good I am? I don't need anything outside of me to make me feel good <laughs> because I'm good of myself, because I'm good in myself. And because I'm good of myself and in myself, I am good all by myself and I was saying I was sitting there saying oh God you are good and so when somebody else got up and said God is good I was the loudest all the time <laughs> and as I started thinking about the goodness of God I was thinking to myself as the spirit was opening up my mind pulling me out of that critical uh, thinking he was saying to me Paul do you know how really good I am he says I'm good I'm infinitely good which means you can't measure my goodness. My goodness is inestimable. Uh, you, can't, you can't even have enough digits in your calculator to measure how good I am. You can't even weigh my goodness. My good is infinite. My goodness is so good. I am good from everlasting to everlasting. Infinitely good. My goodness is so good. My goodness is inexhaustible. I will say, my, 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 God is good. And when someone else got up and says, God is good, I will say, all the time. God is good. So I came up from Auckland to Whangarei today to say to the people of faith in this house of hope, this launching pad, this missional launching pad that God uses to reach the city, to take the city and to take the nation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to say whatever it is you're going through, if you just sit still and let God be God, if you just sit still in the posture of obedience and just let God be God, where he will steer you, he'll reveal to you his glory. What he'll bring you to, 
he'll take you through. And be patient because he's testing you so he can bless you with more. So that this one life you live will not be wasted for your own self-aggrandizement and achievement. But this one life that you live with everything you've acquired and accumulated, you would understand that God has given it to you for his kingdom purposes and for the glory of his name. So I ask you to tell three people this morning, just stay still and know that he's God. Tell them, two, three people, just turn to them. Just be still. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.